Yeah, you know, I, I'm often embarrassed to say that I, I was a division commander and a corps commander in Iraq, and I really didn't know what post-traumatic stress was. I knew um, that when I had a formation uh, that had a difficult day because of a loss, whether it was uh, teammates wounded or killed, um, that I had um, some teams, mental health teams, that were available to me to send to that spot and they would help those individuals. But I, I really had no idea what they did. I just knew because I was brought up by a leader who said, hey, this is a really important asset. Uh, and if you ever get in a situation, make sure that they've got priority um, for air so they can get in quickly uh, and help soldiers uh, re recover from trauma. Um, so both as a Corps commander and as a division commander, uh, I used those assets liberally, but I really didn't know what they were doing. It, it wasn't until I became the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army and somebody laid a chart in front of me, uh, and it listed the most uh, serious um, wounds uh, of the war uh, seven years after it started, and I expected to see those who had been shot, um, lost arms, legs, multiple limbs, to be the far left of that chart and, and then have it rapidly descend down because when I was in, in, in command, those, the, that's the time I went to the, to the hospital um, when I heard that one of my soldiers had been wounded, wounded uh, in an event, but I had no idea what post-traumatic stress traumatic brain injury was. When I looked at that chart four days into my time as vice, when the medical command put it in front of me to show me uh, the most wounds that we had, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress were on the far left of that chart. They averaged in 2008 um, 36% of the most serious wounds, 30% uh, or greater VA disability. Um, those who had lost arms, legs, or had been shot um, were at 11%. And they stayed constant uh, at that number, I think through the war, but at least the four years I was vice, at 11%. The number with post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury doubled in that time. Um, so I was surprised. And quite frankly, I couldn't define what either one of them was. Sure, I had uh, played football as a young kid, but I remember my coach when I got bonked on the head saying, shake it off and get back in the game. Um, I really didn't know what post-traumatic stress was, so I asked a whole bunch of folks, doctors, and um, they disagreed with each other exactly what it was. They didn't know. We had no biological diagnostics for it, which is a real issue. Uh, it's like going in and telling a doc, hey, I've got a broken leg. Uh, and the doctor asking you 30 questions, not putting a hand on you, not sending you to an x-ray machine or anything, and then saying, no, you don't have a broken leg. Um, and and th that's really where we were with diagnostics for post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. And, and quite frankly, that's really where we are today. Um, some may disagree with me but we don't have biological diagnostics. We've, we've found a blood biomarker for traumatic brain injury. It's gonna be absolutely critical um, that is, is, is being brought to market right now, uh, but it'll be a long time before it's adopted throughout medicine. Um, so I realized we had a problem. It was a growing problem, and when you're Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, I believe that's your job. Your, your job is to look forward, see where you have problems and, 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 and where you need to apply um, your ability uh, to pull resources together to fix it. I found a great partner uh, in a Marine named Jim Amos, who was my counterpart in the Marine Corps. Uh, he was seeing the same thing I was seeing uh, in the Marine Corps, and together we, we worked um, to, um, I think, revolutionize the way that we treat uh, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress in combat situations. 